Alrighty. I'll just launch right in. And I'm passing around um, a couple handouts. Ready. I'm ready, thank you. Okay, there's our farm. There's my, my other half. Um, a couple handouts that just shows, that I'll reference throughout the talk too. And one last shameless promotional plug here. Actually, I have a lot of electronic copies and what, you, what I'm handing out here. I'm happy to email them to you in addition to some other plant, plant lists or things that have been helpful to us in getting started that I won't, it, won't talk about as much today because I'll focus more on marketing. So I so wanted to frame it, which comes first then, the currents or the market? Well, let me take you to LA Val, which is about midway between Madison and La Crosse, Wisconsin. Um, I'm like right here, so if you're <laughs> going up there. So we, ha uh, we, when I say we, my, our farm's Hilltop Community Farm, our base market is a um, diversified CSA. We do primarily vegetables. Um, we sell direct, and we are very much small scale toward big impact. So our scale is for our vegetables, we're growing on just under 8,000 square feet. And for our orchard that I'm gonna focus on what, we're, what we've been learning from there and, and with fruit production um, is just under an acre. So I think in the back of your mind, no matter what scale you're at, think what, that, what, what is optimal for you and also think about, okay, what is something that has helped me succeed in my own operation or research that I could share on with, the, with someone else in this crowd here today or at home? Or the flip end of that, what will help you find success? So i um, definitely interested in, in learning because we're, <laughs> we're constantly tweaking and um, kind of a combination of here's our baseline plan, but we've, de we've solved a lot in design with um, how do you kind of weave in people's feedback to help inform your products and output on the way. And I think that's kind of a flexibility you have with direct marketing, may, um, that's my assumption. So anyhow, um, broader context, well, we have 20, you know, 59 acres, we manage prairie, um, 25 in prairie, um, we've got some woodland, but most of our, our production is pretty small scale. Um, this is a picture of our products and services um, during the off-farm off quote season. Um, <laughs> I co-teach a short course um, at UW-Madison, um, and then I also enjoy uh, doing farmer-to-farmer -farmer learning and training. Mostly, you know, I just go where the green lights are. And, my, and for me, it's in my backyard, and I've gone to places around the world, mostly Senegal and Ethiopia, et cetera. So, um, so I wanted to hone in and talk about briefly how you grow it, what you get. Um, the particular agroforestry tool that really has spoken to us on our farm is forest gardens, um, particularly a plant guild concept. Um, I won't spend a whole lot of time there because it's more marketing. And then the, to delve into that question, how do we resolve the if you grow it, will they come? And some of the things we've learned from various tools we've tried out with, with getting like, okay, so who, you know, what the heck's a Saskatoon and who wants to eat it, right? <laughs> so, so um, all right, so we've always had a community of fruit on our farm. For our CSA, fruit has helped us sell things. We're small scale. Um, and so we've always grown pears and apples and hardy kiwi and raspberry. And so about in 2010, we've been you know, talking to farmer friends and people like at these conferences, which are great for, and continue, you know, we've, um, Carindale Farm in Wisconsin in particular, it was exciting to learn that you're doing a bunch of horticultural screening, because that helped inspire our thinking on, oh, but came out of someone's research before and mindful thinking, we sort of took the top eight plants from Carindale and like, well, can we apply it to a food forest system? And what's the best mix, market mix? So we looked at things like adding to the community of, of um, fruit, aronia, quince, currants, sea berry, Saskatoon, and we had gooseberry, but that was a flop. Um, there was something to be said about sequencing and your planning. <laughs> we won't go into that so much. And honeyberry. So, so we wanted to see about, okay, can our goal was to find fruits that are high yielding, grower friendly, require minimal inputs, um, are are like you know high nutritional value, and I think what's tweaked a little bit for us is that um, having both direct and value-added appeal. So for us, we're, we're 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 diversity is definitely our risk management strategy. But we're looking at we were kind of like, well, can we start a fruit CSA? That was one question we were looking at, and so we were thinking about the sequencing. We wanted fruit available through the whole season. We want to be able to stack functions so you can eat a fresh current, or you can maybe try a juice, or maybe you want to dry, dry it, or there could be room to expand. So those are the things we were exploring when we initially set out to to grow our um, our orchard, and. 
Um, you'll notice, um, just to take you to the orchard, um, I'm kind of assuming people know fo forest garden guilds. I don't have to go into that so much, but um, so the whole idea of finding um, plants that have complementary functions, whether um, during the time of year, what they're using in the soil profile, are they adding fertility in the form of sea berry? Um, so that was kind of the, the production model we're looking at. And, and can forest gardens then serve as a metaphor for how we grow things and market? So you think about food forest, interdependence, right? They're sharing resources, creating networks of mutual support, yet they have their each individual fruit autonomy. So how do we do that as a farm <laughs> and eating that? So that's been a fun thing. And for us, um, we love learning and, and, and sharing things along the way. So we don't claim to know everything. Um, what we did is uh, at each step of the planting process, there's um, our, our, um, our early map of our replicable guilds. We've added a few since then. And um, I don't want to spend too much time on production. Oops, wow, ah, getting excited with the clicker. <laughs> um, so we, we had people at every level of the process. So people helped us plan. People opened it up our farm for tours. And along the way, you kind of grow your community of fruit lovers, but you also can ask a lot of questions and introduce people to, I never heard of this, or oh, I had no idea about food forests, et cetera. So you start to build you know, your story into that, and so you start to attract people. And what we've found was really interesting. Um, at every one of our events, we've kind of had a combination of people who are farming already to people who've never heard of things or more on the eater side. And then you meet people who are like, I had no idea down the road. Um, there's someone growing aronia too. And so that sort of networking opportunity when you open yourself up to what's possible um, comes along the way and tasting things. So just briefly lessons learned with establishment. Um, we think the jury's a little bit still out uh, with aronia and honeyberry and seaberry, uh, most notably because we haven't had a lot of yield yet from that. And um, I think aronia definitely renders itself to value added. If you've had fresh aronia, you might be able to, to back that claim up. <laughs> I know people are also doing a lot of things with the wholesaling on, on aronia. So for direct market fruit, I don't know if it's very well um, but if you're looking at honeyberry, Tyler, I think that's awesome because I think that there's, there might be something about microclimates and I'm glad you're researching that one because I, I saw there are hard, so one of the challenges I would say in general is you're introducing new fruits into the market and then on the supply side, you can't always get re reliable cultivars or ones that you want or do well. Um, we did all of this. We had some support through the Farmer Rancher Grant Program with the SARE, with um, Sustainable Ag, with North Central SARE. Um, and then we did our establishment with about $6,000 um, as a baseline. Again, we're pretty under-mechanized, so we don't have a lot of equipment. So for, food, forest gardens work well for us, um, especially the guild pattern, because we figured, can we solve this in de design where you know we don't have equipment going through? And it's scalable, so you could have 25, you could have 2,500, you could have one guild, and get a lot of the same impact. So then, <laughs> all right, four years in, holy cow, we have a lot of currants. What do we do with these? And concurrently, um, as we're doing this, if you grow it, will they come? Well, <laughs> the beauty of this is life has a way of intervening. Um, so again, I was talking to some fruit friends um, or just farmers at a conference and realized, oh, we're growing the same things. We're in the same level of production. We have the same issue. <laughs> so we have to work together, right? So, um, so we, um, when I say we, there's a farm up in Herbster nor on the south shore of Lake Superior, elsewhere farm. And there's another farmer friend we were working with in um, just outside of Menominee. We, their market's mostly to the Twin Cities. And we were kind of thinking of what's the best fit for um, direct marketing of fruit, which is kind of delve into what we've discovered. So um, leave it to the you know, partnerships in the SARE program. That was super helpful too in letting us explore market research. Because as you all know, marketing, you need to, you need to budget time to, to market. And with new fruit products, you can expect to, well, we found um, that it's, we, did, we can expect about 25% of our budget and time for fruits going toward market research. Now we, like, we know ourselves, we know we love to connect with people and education is part of our mission on our farm. But that, that was something that, you know, make sure you plan for. Um, and then so programs and where professional support can help is, is with, that, with that place. So, 
So the biggest thing we're going for with our goals is, well, what's the best fit um, for some of these fruits on our farm? Is it a CSA for us? Um, and, or is it a market or restaurants or something else? Um, and then how do we price that, right? Oh, good question. <laughs> um, I just had to put this up here because I, I, we love that we're like one, one of 400 acres in the US who grow quince. Um, <laughs> so, but quince, is, while it's historically the love apple, yes, it is not just a labor of love. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of work that goes into things. Um, so I want to just put up here and kind of talk a little bit about the, the pricing conundrum that you have with perennials. Um, and here's where I will reference our spreadsheet and just talk about currants in particular as an example. So one beauty, beautiful thing is, is if you're starting from scratch, you know, it's overwhelming, yes, but you now have the chance to do things differently, like if you like, like tracking your labor <laughs> when you're out doing basic tasks. So we had a chance to uh, like look at our investment costs um, in the first four years. And what we did was, um, you know, what are our inputs, you know, for plant material, um, water, energy usage, land value, and we did that on a per plant basis, so per square foot, meaning again, we, we wanted to, like, how can this be helpful to growers at, at kind of any scale, right? So rather than say you needed X amount of, uh, of acreage to start with, well, you only need two currents, or what if you wanted just to try out two currents, here's what you might expect, or maybe then you can see how you could scale it to 2,000. So that was our thinking with that, because we had a really hard time finding consistent price data. You know, there's always the, well, what the market will bear, right? <laughs> and, well, what are your costs of production? Those are all really important things, but um, we wanted to put some numbers behind it, and time is definitely part of that. Um, so let's see, what can I share with you about tools that we used? Um, Market research, again, going out, well, what are people selling currents for at the farmer's market? <laughs> or what are other regions doing? Um, what, you know, we did some surveys, both farmers and eaters, um, some tastings and conversation. They take a lot of time, but that's like where you're gonna get your best information from. And then also looking at, well, how much, what's our cost for all this? And then you kind of look at that with your with perennial plants, um, a little more forgiving than, than trees maybe. We, you can start with currants. It was a nice um, kind of transitional fruit because you can start to see, um, start harvesting after two to three years, and then we're waiting for quince. Well, that's dancing along. And then if you have things like chestnuts, you know, and that's 20 years down. <laughs> so, so you can kind of start to see the sequencing. Um, and then we also took how much are where we harvesting. So on average, we found four to five pounds of plant, um, bearing age at two to four years. Um, we could probably expect more. We're also in that optimal scale. Like, let's just be like water this year. Pause, capture, redirect if needed. <laughs> Manage what we have, even though it's an acre. There's a lot going on, going on there. Um, and then we also took like well. How, for one year of data, we found we could harvest about six to eight pints an hour. And that was pretty consistent with a few of the other farms. And it was also consistent with other farms who were selling June berries or Saskatoons. That's how much they were doing per hour. Um, what we were charging, you know, on average, the price per pound, like $6, a little over $6. Um, and this is for upper Midwest. And, you know, our market's mainly Madison area, um, some local folks in Reedsburg. Um, and our, CS, our CSA worked really well because they're already used to weird things and you have people who are like committed to you for the whole season. So they'll give you an honest, oh, the sea berry sucked or what are you, what are you feeding us, you know, or something. So that's, that's another good thing to have a good baseline market. Um, and then we were tracking on, okay, as a whole, how much time are we spending in the orchard overall managing? And I think for us, we're really curious to be like, oh, wow, this is, you know, we're looking at phasing out of vegetable CSA for different reasons, but one of them being, you know, I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> Vegetables are a lot of work. So our perennials are a little different, but um, I think in terms of disturbance and um, there's other value that fruit, I think, has. Um, and also, we have land tenure on our farm, so I kind of feel like I have an obligation to be growing something perennial, right, when a lot of farmers who aren't in my situation or looking for land, maybe vegetables an easier way to, for them to start. So, all right, as an aside, coming back to customer analysis, um, what, here's what we found from our survey stuff, that, which was interesting. 
Most of the people who are buying fruit direct are getting it from their farmers markets or co-ops. CSA was like fifth on the list. We think CSA has a good market uh, potential, um, not just because that's what, what we do and know, um, but we also think that CSAs are kind of changing a little, um, at least a lot of like, we're starting to see models where they're, they're like more acting like aggregators. So maybe you can be the fruit supplier for your CSA. Because I think doing a, a truly local CSA with all the fruit from your farm for the season is really hard in the upper Midwest. <laughs> so unless you kind of shift like, oh, well, we're going to reach the people that want to do like big canning kind of level. So um, anyway, uh, farmer practices, what they valued, sustainable growing practices were top on the list. Why they buy, taste. You know, and that's the value of if you can take people from plant to table, get it out in front of them, hook up with a chef um, or someone who likes, you know, just find, find those partners. Um, barriers, oh, this was, let's see, well, access to small fruits. You know, we are still a niche market. I don't know if currants will ever get to the main, mainstream. I'd like to think so. <laughs> um, but, but I think, you know, trying to, so that's, that's why we're like part of opening up your farm and connecting and growing, growing different fruits or just being open about what you're doing is you're helping like spread, spread that around. So it is, so people, your customers aren't getting frustrated. You know, they're like, oh, well, I've tried those once a year, but oh, I don't have them this year, but you can go to Keefe and he's got some great elderberries going on now. Um, anyway, and this was also really interesting. So we were, we were, at, we were you know, we priced our currants at $5 a pint. And what we found that, you know, if, if people, you know, without having tasted the fruit, they'll be like, oh, right around five seems like reasonable. But that they're willing to pay more if they're, if you get it out in front of them and you're out there engaging and bring them to the farm or, or like, or the, the point of all this is if you, they have a face to what the product is and can taste it in a story, then you, then they're willing to pay more. So um, it seems obvious, but you know, you don't know until you ask. <laughs> so um, that's, that was just uh, looking at currents from what we found from our research. Um, highlights in our um, fourth year, well in general, I think fruit sells. It sells for us. I think also too, when in thinking of planning, um, you want to be um, making sure you have outlets before you pick anything, right? So, so all our fruit, especially any kind of berry fruit, is sold before we go out and harvest. You don't want to be hustling and trying to find a market outlet while you're in the, in the middle of the field, et cetera. Um, we saw a 20% increase in our sales and markets from across the board from introducing some of these fruit, fruit channels. And now you might look at some of our numbers and be like, Aaron, this is really low yet. Well, yes, again, <laughs> we're still learning what's coming in. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think in general, fruit offers a better return per unit of time for labor versus vegetable production. Um, you know, and that's not accounting for like ecosystem services. I think less soil disturbance in our guild pattern. You know, we've been trying to figure out the herb layer. We've got a, quite a diversity, about 43 different species interplanted in our orchard and around our field border. Um, we also um, have a honeybee hive, um, which is a lot of fun, <laughs> but um, for pollinators and such. I think if you're gonna start out in any kind of market, you know, um, marketing venture, the more you can get product out in front of people and share with them how to, how to use things um, and, and give them kind of that, in addition to having your own sense of optimal scale for your land, giving people an optimal amount. <laughs> you don't want to overwhelm them with too much or too little. Um, like have a low hanging fruit. So if you just are, you know, we have apples and pears as like the easy access, like the gateway fruit drug or something, you know, to, <laughs> to, to like, oh, no, I know you want elderberries now. Um, and <laughs> so, so all those things are kind of, I'm just talk, there's a lot to cover, I think, but just some of the key takeaways. Um, our challenge is a continuum of like, what is our optimum scalability? We have one acre, what can we get out of this one acre? Do we need more to, so that, you know, Rob and I both enjoy doing other things on our farm, but it would be really great if we could shift our income stream from 40% on farm to 60 off farm, to like 60 on farm, 40 off farm, so one of us can just be on the farm during the season. So we're still in that dance. Um, and know your market and your risk tolerance. <laughs> so what are you willing to take on? Um, you know, and having that base market existing, you know, so maybe you're already starting out in wholesale, 
just grow, build from that, you know, if that works for you. Um, if you've got a great restaurant thing, go from there. Um, if you can get somebody to market on your behalf or you can get on a show, um, video is really great, but nothing quite beats taste and, and talking to people. Pricing's an ongoing dance. And I think it's important to value your time and your effort. You know, whether it's in knowledge and skills you're sharing or in the product itself, like that has value. And just to be open and honest and listen to what your customers have to say. Um, I think that's, oh, now what? <laughs> it's a giraffe. Um, I'm sorry. I don't know. I think right now where we're at this year is sometimes you just have to play the fool, which is a black current fool creation, and drink it too. So there's so much room to experiment and be creative. Um, and then I think you know it's it's that thing of knowing your baseline and being open to what's possible. Um, but, and that's so customers have helped us and farmers too along the way on tweaking things. Um, and, okay, last and I promise. Um, <laughs> what's working for us and how do we do more of it? Expanded currency, we have a, a fruit market share, fruit bucks program. I can share with you that card. Um, fruit to table, that, and then supplying fruit to CSAs. Broadly, I think what's really needed where we can help each other out at places like uh, this, uh, Agroforestry Network is just the, the need for more mid-tier processing. So you have two acres of aronia, that's a lot of one crop, but yet juicers aren't even going to look at you. So how do you fill that gap? Um, those kinds of things. Ner reliable nursery stock. I'm looking at you, Tyler, because you are going to be the answer. <laughs> um, and then portable equipment processing. I know River Hills Harvest and Elderberries and the University of Missouri have done some great work trying to create satellite hubs for de-stemming. And, and so I think the more we can kind of find that middle collaborative place, better and come visit us may the fruit forest be with you <laughs> I have a ch okay one other so I'm queen of the handouts this is just a business model one page canvas just so like if you're doing any kind of planning this was helpful especially for markets to think through what are your market channels who is your segment like maybe you are not you know we're going for the 35 plus crowd retirement age what income level all those things are important to focus Okay, Thank you. thanks, Aaron. Thank you.